what's really surprising about Beaujolais is just how diverse and how complex a region it is. Hmm. And we have this perception of Beaujolais, which is largely made from the Gamay grape as a simple, carefree wine. What is one example of the complexity of this region or the wine that would surprise people? There are effectively 10 kinds of Beaujolais. There's basic Beaujolais, there's Beaujolais Village, and there are 10 crews, all based on granite soils. There is far more complexity when you dig down, quite literally. Our perceptions of Beaujolais as a region are largely dictated by a rather out-of-date model that's predicated on Beaujolais Nouveau. It told people around the world where Beaujolais was and what the Gamay grape was. But unfortunately, people's ideas have kind of got stuck at Beaujolais Nouveau. And there's just so much more to the region than that. Have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 278. What's behind the surprising complexity and variety of Beaujolais wines? How has Beaujolais Nouveau distorted the public perception of Beaujolais? And what makes Beaujolais such a great value wine. In today's episode, you'll hear the stories and tips that answer those questions in our chat with Master of Wine, Natasha Hughes, who is working on a book about Beaujolais. In personal news, I'm just back from a wonderful trip to the heart of British Columbia's wine region, the Okanagan Valley. The journey actually started on January 12th when an email popped into my inbox. Side note, why do all of the biggest changes in my life start with an unexpected email? No matter. It was from Dan Pazakowski, President and Chief Executive Officer of Wine Growers Canada, which is an organization representing 800 wineries across the country. And I can now share his confidential note with you. It read, I am delighted to inform you that you have been selected as the 2024 recipient of the WGC Wine Industry Champion Award. This award is presented to an individual who has demonstrated outstanding leadership, commitment, and passion for the advancement of the Canadian wine industry through media, research, policy, regulation, education, or other means, significantly contributing to the overall strength and long-term viability of the industry. You were nominated by a member of the Canadian wine industry and enthusiastically co-selected by a national industry committee. The committee recognizes and appreciates your indefatigable, ugh, indefatigable, find it always hard to say that word. Anyway, indefatigable support for the Canadian wine industry. The award will be presented on March 12th at the Penticton Trade and Convention Centre as part of a joint Wine Growers Canada, Wine Growers British Columbia Awards ceremony. The event will be attended by Canadian wineries from across the country and is sure to be a very memorable event. Please note we will not be releasing this news until March 12th, so we ask you to keep it quiet until then. As background, this is the highest award a Canadian can win who does not work for a winery. Previous winners include Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, Marie-Claude Bibot, and Dr. Debbie Inglis, Director of Brock University's Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Degree Program. Well now, a week of happy dancing in my bedroom followed that email. Cue the song Stronger by Kelly Clarkson. I actually found it really hard to settle down and get back to work, especially since I couldn't tell anyone. Anyway, then the organization asked me to deliver an acceptance speech of about five minutes to the industry audience. Gulp. I didn't know what to say except to avoid those saccharine sweet speeches that we hear at this time of year. 
So I tried to turn it around and to focus on the industry, which has been going through a really rough year, especially in the West. After going through the hell of wildfires, British Columbia has gone through a freak frost event that's killed most of the buds on the vines. They're expecting a 97% crop loss this year. Ugh. There's just no putting rosé glasses on that news. So I wanted to share with you what I said to the audience that night. Thank you to Wine Growers Canada, Wine Growers British Columbia, and to all of you here tonight for this recognition. I feel so fortunate to be part of an industry that creates a product that not only contributes so much to our economy, but also to our souls with its sensory pleasure, its family roots, and its wild variety. My only regret is that I didn't get involved with wine sooner. When I graduated from business school, I was so pragmatic. Following your passion was, well, for arts majors. So I joined Procter & Gamble on the Crisco brand, where I spent many soulless days and nights watching focus groups of women talking about their flaky pie crusts. And no matter how hard I tried, I could not pour my soul into baking fat. So I decided that high-tech marketing would be more interesting and joined a supercomputer company based in Mountain View, California, which eventually got purchased and became the headquarters of Google. It was more exciting, but I still didn't feel grounded in a culture that urged us to move fast and break things. The best thing that came from visiting California so often was developing a taste for wine. When I finally joined the wine industry, I felt as though I'd been dropped out of a brave new world and stumbled onto the set of Downton Abbey. Instead of move fast and break things, it was, whoa, slow down and heal things. Like the healing that can come through a quiet conversation over a great glass of wine. Or the warmth of the sun sliding over your shoulders as you walk through a vineyard. And the pleasure of breathing in the deep, sweet scent of grapes hanging heavy in the air. Wine drew me outside again. It got me out of my head and away from the computer I was chained to in my tech job. Some employees there slept under their desks to work longer. Guilty. We used to say we were mole people. We shrank from the sunlight. Well, the Canadian wine industry, particularly in the West, has been through many dark nights of the soul. And to a certain extent, I know what it's like to have your personal and professional lives go up in flames, as I wrote in my latest book with the cheery title, Wine Witch on Fire, Rising from the Ashes of Divorce, Defamation, and Drinking Too Much. While writing the book, I came across the wonderful winemaking term, dry extract, that refers to the essence of a wine's flavor components when all the moisture has evaporated. I believe that dry extract is in us, too, as people. It's what's left after life has burned us down to our essence. And if we can hold on to it, we can rise again. And that is what I see for Canadian wine, because no other industry has the potential for renewal, growth, and revitalization. No other industry celebrates what is cyclical and seasonal and and completely out of our control. Wine reaches a place that baking fat, computer chips, and any other consumer product cannot touch. Although I've been fortunate to win a few writing awards in the U.S. and Australia, nothing compares to being recognized for your own people for something more than just words on a page, but for a calling that embraces your mind, body, and soul. So I raise my glass to all of you here tonight who create something out of sun and soil that we can all pour our souls into. Cheers. Thank you for sharing this moment with me as a listener to this podcast. Well, I have to ask, have you read Wine Witch on Fire? If yes, well then, have you bought a copy for a friend? Please do that if you'd like to support this podcast that I do for you on a volunteer basis to ensure it continues. You can order it from any online book retailer, no matter where you live. It usually arrives in a day or two, and of course, the ebook is instant, and the book is a fast read. Every little bit helps spread the message in this book of hope, justice, and resilience. 
you can send a copy directly to a friend or family member and make their day when a gift arrives in the mail rather than another bill. I'll put a link in the show notes to all retailers worldwide at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 279. If you've read the book or are reading it, I'd love to hear from you at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. Okay, on with the show. Now, before I introduce my guest, let me say that one of you is going to win a copy of the terrific new book to which she was a contributor. It's called On Burgundy, From Maddening to Marvelous in 59 Tales. All you have to do is email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com and let me know that you'd like to win a copy. I'll choose one person randomly from those who contact me. All right. Natasha Hughes is one of only three people to win four awards when graduating from the prestigious Master of Wine program, including the Outstanding Achievement Award. She started her wine career as the deputy editor for Decanter Magazine's website, then subsequently became a freelance food and wine writer. She is currently a columnist for Vinocity and has written for Club Enologique, Square Meal, Imbibe, Australian Gourmet Traveler Wine, and JancisRobinson.com, among others. In addition to contributing to On Burgundy, Natasha is working on a solo book on Beaujolais. Both are for the wine library series Academy du Vin. She is also deeply involved in educating the next generation of MWs and is a member of the Institute of Masters of Wine Council. Natasha has judged wine competitions around the world and consults for restaurants, private clients, wine producers, and generic bodies. She joins us now from her home in London. Welcome, Natasha. It's great to have you here with us. Hi, Natalie. It's good to be here too. And gosh, you make me sound like quite a scary person, actually. (laughs) Just a well-educated one and one who's most expert on our topic today. We're going to focus on Beaujolais, but I know that you know a lot about other regions, other wine topics. But I want to dive into Beaujolais because that seems to be where you've taken a special interest. So let's start with what is the most surprising insight you gained or discovered while writing either your piece for On Burgundy or while you're researching your current solo book on Beaujolais? So I think, you know, one of the things, and really I shouldn't have been surprised, you know, I've been writing about wine for over 20 years and I really shouldn't have been surprised by this. But I kind of was, you know, you do your official wine education and you learn certain truths about Beaujolais, about the terroir of the region and how the wines are made. And then you go to the region and the more questions you ask, the more complex the answers become. So what's really surprising about Beaujolais is just how diverse and how complex a region it is. (laughs) And we have this perception of Beaujolais, which is largely made from the Gamay grape as a wine, as a simple, carefree wine. Uh, We're going to dive into the cruise and so on, but what is one example of the complexity of this region or the wine that would surprise people? So one of the things that you learn when you do formal wine education is that there are effectively 10 kinds of Beaujolais. There's basic Beaujolais, there's Beaujolais Village, and there are 10 crews. And you get told that the 10 crews are all based on granite soils. Well, it turns out that the Beaujolais region sponsored one of the most exhaustive geological surveys of the region that I've ever seen from anywhere in the world. And they dug pits across the entire region to find out what the soils were like. And this truth that the crews are based on granite soils, well, it turns out not to be quite as straightforward a picture as the kind of the lessons might tell you that exists. So, you know, there is far more complexity when you dig down quite literally in this particular instance than when you sort of skim the surface of the region. I think it's a region that our perceptions of Beaujolais as a region are largely dictated by a rather out-of-date model that's predicated on Beaujolais Nouveau. And Beaujolais Nouveau was a great vehicle for the region. It told people around the world where Beaujolais was and what the Gamay Great was. But unfortunately, people's ideas have 
kind of got stuck at Beaujolais Nouveau. And there's just so much more to the region than that. That's great. And so different soil types and different styles and so on. And is there anything someone has said about Beaujolais that has been surprising to you? I think so. In a kind of negative way, the thing that surprises me most is how even people who are deeply involved in the world of wine are still inclined to dismiss a region that actually is really interesting. Wow. Okay. So let's open their eyes and taste buds if we can today. Now, as you mentioned, when many people think of Beaujolais, they think of Nouveau, which is that sort of fresh grapey wine released immediately after the harvest or very soon after, every third Thursday in November. We'll come back to that later. But let's talk about Beaujolais as a region, maybe situated on the map, because I think in some of our email conversations, you've also said that some people are even surprised it's part of Burgundy. We think of Burgundy and the benchmark Pinot Noirs to the north, but give us a visual map of Burgundy and where Beaujolais sits. So Beaujolais is kind of Geographically, it is located between, so as you travel south down France, you go through Dijon and then you hit the Côte de Nuit and then you go through the Côte de Beaune and then you go through the Côte Chalonnaise and the Maconnais and then you hit Beaujolais. And Beaujolais is situated effectively the southernmost vineyards of Burgundy and the northernmost vineyards of Beaujolais you know, you cross the road and you go from one region to another. And historically, one of the most important things geographically for Beaujolais is that it's about, well, currently, you know, if you've got a good car and there's a decent motorway system, it's about a half an hour's drive north of Lyon, which is one of the biggest cities in France. So commercially, Beaujolais has always had strong links with Lyon, which is in the Rhone. Administratively and historically, the region has had strong links with Burgundy to the north. And I think in official, you know, the way the wine world is split up, Beaujolais is considered to be part of the greater Burgundian region. And it's certainly true that historically there are very strong links between Burgundy and Beaujolais. But you know this thing about the closer you dig into Beaujolais, the more complicated it gets. Administratively, Burgundy stops somewhere around Fleury, which is partway down the cruise. So as you drive south through the cruise, you actually transition from the department of Burgundy to the north to the department of the Rhone to the south. So Beaujolais is a real halfway house geographically between Burgundy and the northern Rhone. It's a halfway house Historically, commercially, a lot of the big negus houses in Burgundy traditionally have made Beaujolais as well. So that has strengthened the links between the two regions. But commercially, most of the wines, if they were shipped out, they were shipped south because they were shipped to Lyon. Because why on earth would you be shipping Gamay north to a region that produced Pinot Noir? But here's the picker. Historically, Gamay was grown in the wider Burgundy region. It's only relatively recently, historically, post Phylloxera, the grape has really begun its rock solid link to Beaujolais rather than the Burgundian region. And for those who don't know, post Phylloxera, the root louse that destroyed European and North American vineyards in the 1800s. So they replanted Gamay. Did they replant a better version of it? Or what happened after that? So the first thing to realize is that one of the earliest references you find to Gamay is one of the Dukes of Burgundy talked about this evil, this nasty grape variety that had to be uprooted and dug out, removed from Burgundy because... It- he called it disloyal. <laughs> it wasn't based on patriotic. And actually, I think when you look at it, Gamay is a very productive grape variety. And if you plant it on Burgundy's rather generous soils, it tends to produce copiously and 
high yield gamay is not necessarily a great thing because what you get is you get lots and lots of grapes with not very concentrated fruit flavors and the acidity is way high and the alcohol level is way low and it doesn't make very good wine. So, you know, very good reason for getting rid of it out of these kind of clay and limestone soils. Yeah, I'd say that's disloyal as a grape. Like That's just bad behavior. <laughs> but if you put it on the granite soils, actually, they're not all granite soils. If you put it on the soils of the crew zones in Beaujolais, it produces wonderful wines. And why is that? Is it because the crew soils have better drainage or they just make the plants suffer more? Or? The soils in the crews are, there's a lot of granite, but there are also, it's a really complex geological situation, but there are a lot of soils in the crew zones that make gamay work really hard. Doesn't yield as abundantly. If it doesn't yield as abundantly, then flavours get concentrated, the sugar levels go up, some of that acidity is tamed, and it's transmuted. So if you put Pinot Noir on the soils of the crews, it would really, really struggle. It needs some of the generosity that you get in the Burgundian soils. Whereas Gamay in those Burgundian soils just kind of goes, hey, let's have a party, and it's badly behaved. Right. Okay. So a stricter boarding school, if you will, <laughs> put a tight leash on Gamay. And so how big is the region? Just I know it's going to vary in terms of how much wine is produced, but give us an idea of maybe how many bottles it produces, how many acres or hectares. Give us a size. Ooh, right. Okay. This is difficult. I, uh, so it's worth considering that I've just come back from a research trip to Beaujolais. And I was based in just outside Villiers Morgan, which is the biggest village in Morgan. And Morgan is a crew that's about three quarters of the way south down the run of crews. I can get to Saint Amour at the top in about 20 minutes by car. So fairly small. On winery roads. It's small. And, you know, east to west, it's not particularly big. Of course, there is, once you've got to the bottom of the crew zone, you've still got the Beaujolais Beaujolais zone. And the Beaujolais village zone runs to largely sort of around the periphery of the crew zone. But it's a small region. You would be hard pushed, I think, you know, 35, 40 minutes drive. And this is on country roads to go north, south. All the way. Okay. And how does that compare with Burgundy proper or whatever, not proper, but to the north? Burgundy and proper. Well, Chablis itself is a good hour's drive north of Dijon. And Dijon is, you know, once you're south of Dijon, then you hit the Côte de Nuit. It's far more spread out. So it takes you about an hour, an hour and a half-ish to drive from Dijon down to Beaujolais. All right. Gives us a sense of that. Um, on motorways. Okay. Right. Not those country lanes. Not country lanes. So you Beaujolais is a compact little growing region. Huh. And yet we think of it as big because we perceive the wines as light, as I said, carefree, but it doesn't mean it comes from a big region and there is complexity. Here's one of the kickers. If you go to the Beaujolais region, so particularly when I first visited the region some 20 or so years ago, the traditional style of viticulture pertained, and there's still a lot of it around. So Basically, traditional vineyards had bush vines low to the ground. I mean, like, yay low to the ground. Not trained on the trellises, yes. Not trained on the trellises. Little just kind of plants dug in the soil, about 10,000 of them per hectare, nine to 10,000 of them. That is a lot of plants per hectare. And if you're growing bush vines like that, you can't work them by machines. And quite a lot of them are on slopes. And yet people were being asked to make wines. They were getting paid nothing for these wines. Because the whole point about Beaujolais Nouveau is it's cheap and cheerful. So you had this dilemma. You had this region where it was really hard to farm these vines. It was really hard work. You couldn't mechanise it. 
because of the way the plants were planted. You couldn't mechanise it because a lot of the plants were planted on slopes. And yet nobody was prepared to pay anything. Did that result in any cutting corners quality-wise or trying to find cost savings in other ways since the market wasn't? So I think one of the big problems with Beaujolais Nouveau. So I've talked about the commercial links with Lyon. And a lot of the wine from Beaujolais was sold in Lyon. And Lyon is a city that has a lot of bars and a lot of restaurants. And it was a good quaffing wine that you could drink in the informal bars and restaurants in Lyon. And quite often there was a rush to get the wine from. This wasn't, generally speaking, a lot of the Beaujolais that was produced was not wine to be aged. So, you know, you got it into the bars pretty much as soon as you could after the vintage. So that would be November, for instance, and people would drink it and really enjoy it. And along came a negotiant, a guy called Georges Duboeuf, who thought, fantastic tradition. Why don't we take this idea of the Beaujolais Nouveau, this young, prima, easy drinking wine that we're enjoying, that we're selling a lot of in Lyon, and why don't we market this idea to the rest of the world? And the whole world went, wow, great idea, easy drinking. You've got to remember that this was in the 70s and 80s when wine was terribly serious. So, you know, this easy drinking, light, fruity, refreshing wine, fantastic, great news. And there was this story and there were races to get these wines into the wine bars on the third Thursday of November. And it really caught on. It caught on around the world. It became incredibly popular. And everybody in Beaujolais who they were making a transition from having been polycultural farmers who grew a few vines and raised chickens and grew their own vegetables. They were transitioning to being wine producers. And they all kind of went Beaujolais Nouveau. It's obviously the way to go. Fantastic. Right. Quick cash flow, great marketing angle. Yeah. Absolutely. The trouble was that this put a lot of pressure on them to produce loads and loads and loads of cheap wine. So inevitably, over time, corners got cut. I think. And the quality of the wines may well have suffered. And as a result, especially once you started to get, I think, fruity, easy drinking wines from the new world being available around the world, all of a sudden, just being fruity and easy to drink wasn't the big cash cow that it may have appeared. So the wines from Beaujolais where people would be milking the cash cow a little too hard and the cash cow was getting a bit bony, maybe. So, you know, I think the popularity took a nosedive because the quality maybe wasn't quite there and the wines weren't quite as fruity and quite as accessible and easy to drink as some of the New World wines. And it became a downward spiral in the region. And they even had competition from countries like Italy with its Nouvellos, Nouveau, I forget what they call them, Novellos. Novello. Yeah. See that much of that in the UK? I think that's sort of possibly more of a thing maybe in North America. But certainly, you know, I think there came a time sort of around the 80s and into the 90s where just being fruity and easy to drink wasn't enough to get you popularity in purchases. Sure. And has George de Boeuf, I've heard he owns about or did own about 10% of production in Beaujolais. Correct me if I'm wrong, but has he gone on to do any other sort of marketing innovations? Well, Monsieur de Boeuf died a while ago. So I believe his son is now in charge of the company. There have been no big innovations as far as I'm aware. Okay. But he's quite a name. His name lives on, even though he does not. <laughs> His name lives on, but actually, I don't know. And, you know, I might regret saying this, but I think the star has faded a bit. Wines used to be widely available everywhere, and you don't see them as much anymore. It's true. Yeah, even here in Canada, that is true. And so just to confirm, Nouveau is so interesting, 
it's made from Gamay. Is more than 95% of wine made from Gamay in Beaujolais? So Gamay is the only red grape that you can grow in Beaujolais. There is some white, and it's Chardonnay. And if you make a Chardonnay in the Beaujolais region, you can call it Beaujolais Blanc, or you can call it Bourgogne Blanc. Okay, just clarifying that. And then the top 10 crew, I'll just rattle them off here and let me know if I've missed or misspoken on any of them. They account for approximately 40, 41% of the region's production. Brui, Chenas, Chirobel. I should get you to say these. I'm going to butcher these. So what you've got from the south, you've got Bruy, you've got de Bruy, you've got Morgon, you've got Renier, you've got Fleury, Chirouble. I mean, some of these are going sort of east-west, but, you know, you get the general picture. You've got moulin Vent, you've got Chenay, you've got Juliana, and you've got Saint-Amour. I think that's fine. Okay, yes. And then the Beaujolais Village is the next tier down, about 25%, and then basic Beaujolais, I guess, 33%. Is that correct? Here's the thing. The way we tend to talk about Beaujolais and Beaujolais Village is that Beaujolais and Beaujolais Village come from kind of the same area and the Beaujolais Village is like, I don't know, a slightly better Beaujolais or something. That's the general perception, isn't it? Actually, there is a Beaujolais Village zone and there are named villages. And then to the south, you've got this kind of largely limestone area. The houses in the area are built from this wonderful golden stone. The region is called the region of the Pierre Doré the golden stones, and it's this wonderful limestone that's in the south that's, you know, great for building houses, maybe not so good for growing gamay, not bad for Chardonnay. So we go back to that problem about gamay kind of being a bit of a party animal. But when you get to this southern region and the limestone soils, which are much more generous and hold far greater reserves of water generally, and the soils in the cruise, Gamay kind of goes, woohoo, and doesn't necessarily produce wines of the same quality as it does. It kind of needs those boundaries. It's kind of like a naughty child. It needs the boundaries. If you don't set the boundaries, it doesn't pay. Right, right. Okay. So the top crews are from the northern part of the region, which if I understand correctly, has the volcanic soils. I'm cribbing off the piece you wrote for her on Burgundy, similar to those of the Cote Rotie in the the Rhone Valley, which lies to the south. But what differentiates them then is more the different layers of soils, like the quartz and the granite and the blue schist. So you've got this complexity of soils. So Fleury and Chirouble are the only two crews that are pretty much exclusively on granite. If you go down to the Côte de Bruy and Bruy, so the Côte de Bruy actually is a mountain. It's an old volcanic mountain, Mont Bruy. And to the south and sort of skirting around it, you've got Bruy. Generally speaking, and it is a broad generalisation, the Côte de Bruy is made of this kind of blue stone. It's a much harder stone, very difficult to break down. It's a volcanic soil that is a blend of diorite and slate. It's very difficult to break down. The pink granite that you find quite a lot in the crews generally, as a rough generalisation, is much more friable and it breaks down into this kind of, they call it granite sand, but actually what it is is smaller particles they're actually often quite a bit larger than sand grains. So typically, Bruy has much more of the pink granite, and the Côte de Bruy has much more of this blue stone. But there are bits of the Côte de Bruy that have granite, and there are bits of Bruy that have the blue stone. Okay. Wow. All right. (laughs) This is welcome to geology today. Oh, I can show you. If you would be interested, I could show you. I can hold up to the camera. A geological map? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll put this in the show notes for those who are listening and cannot see what Natasha is going to show us. So let me find you. Yeah, why not? (laughs) Okay, here we go. Oh, wow. So we've got lots of different colors. Yeah. You've got 
lots of different colors and only the ready orange ones, that's the granite. Okay, very different. Another one, that is Juliana. Oh, wow, very different. Juliana has pretty much no granite at all. Right, different colors, yep. Yep, so all of these different colors, these are from this geological survey that they did. I mean, it was just... They dug pits across the entire region, and they've got the most amazing detailed geological maps, exactly what the soil types are and how deep the soils are before you get to, how deep the topsoils are before you get to the bedrock. And it's a fantastic resource, and it begins to explain the complexity and the typicity that you get in the different subzones. Hmm. Fascinating. And that's where wine gets its complexity, as you say. So again, the answer may be just it's the soils, but just to generalize a little bit, Chenas, Moulin, Vin, and Morgan, they tend to be the most structured of the crew wines. Why is that? It's to do anything that you say about the character of an appellation is always going to be an approximation. It's going to be a generalization because you've got variations in terroir, you've got variations in winemaking styles and approaches, philosophies. So there's always going to be variations. But for instance, Fleury and Chirault have a lot of granite. Very typically, there's a delicacy and a linearity to these wines. And the pink granite wines tend to be more floral expressions, whereas where you get to the dark volcanic soils, the wines tend to have more structure, more power, more tannin, which is not necessarily a word that we typically associate with Gamay. But actually, Gamay, if the yields are controlled, if the winemaking is good, Gamay can have quite a lot of structure. And it's really interesting because one of these myths that we have about Gamay is that this is a wine that has to be drunk. This is a hangover from the Beaujolais Nouveau days. I went to a revelatory tasting last year put on by a producer in Moulin Avant who opened up bottles going back 30 years. And what I found as I've tasted more and more of these old Beaujolais crews is that depending on the vintage character and the terroir, old Beaujolais can look an awful lot like old Burgundy, or it can look an awful lot like older Cote Roti. So quite often you find wines with a density and a spiciness that make you think about Cote Roti, especially in warmer vintages, especially in the more structured terroirs, and in lighter, more delicate vintages, and on the pink granite soils particularly, you know, there is an ethereal quality to Beaujolais that makes you think burgundy. Wow. Okay. So they can age, especially the crews. Yeah. All right. So there's also Beaujolais Village. I go back to, we, we were just about to touch on Beaujolais Village and I got distracted. So Theoretically, you know, the way that we tend to think about Beaujolais Village is that it's got to be like Beaujolais, but just with a little bit more density. It actually comes from a demarcated zone. It comes from particular villages. And a lot of these villages have terroir that looks much, much more like the Cruz than it does the Beaujolais zone. And there are even one or two of the Beaujolais villages that are working to presenting a case to become crews, in the same way that some of the crews are starting to prepare a dossier that would allow them to have premier crew zones. Uh, does that exist now, premier crew, a top top? No, but it's some of the crews are preparing. So the pathway to creating a premier crew is a very long one, and you have to prepare a dossier to prove to the INAO, which is the body that regulates this system. You have to prove that our particular zones have historically always been recognised as being special, distinctive, of high quality, and then they do investigations and taste tests and check their facts. 
And it can take years for a crew to be accepted. So I believe that Fleury is one of the first of the Appellations, possibly the first of the Appellations, to submit some dossiers applying for premier cru status. My understanding is that Moulin Vent, Bruy and Côte de Bruy are also preparing dossiers for some of their vineyards, some of their lieux to become premier cru. And equally, some of the village are starting the process to apply to become crews. Hmm. So that would likely also increase their prices, right? Prices have been increasing in Beaujolais for quite a while for the better qualities of wines. But they are still astounding value to what goes on to the north and to the south. And that's probably why... We're seeing, in part, renaissance in Beaujolais. You know, sommeliers must find them extremely attractive because they can still present these wines on a list with hefty markups, and yet they're not costly. I think there's a few things going on. I think one is there has been, for quite a while now, a growing interest, particularly in high-end restaurants, in finding lighter, fresher styles of red wines that are food-friendly. And Gamay is certainly that. But yes, absolutely. It certainly isn't hurting Beaujolais. The prices in Burgundy have risen to the extent that they have. Right. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Natasha. Here are my takeaways. What's behind the surprising complexity and variety of Beaujolais wines? Well, as Natasha explains, there's a lot of geographical complexity, despite it being such a small region. For instance, the subregions of Fleury and Chiroble have a lot of granite. Very typically, there's a delicacy and linearity to these wines. And even more specifically, pink granite wines tend to have more floral expressions, whereas vines planted on dark volcanic soils produce wines that have more structure, power, and tannin, which are words that we don't necessarily associate with the Gamay grape. Number two, how has Beaujolais Nouveau distorted the public perception of Beaujolais? Well, Nouveau introduced the world to cheap and cheerful wines, as Natasha says, but the quality of the wine suffered in the race to compete with new, easy-drinking New World wines. And in recent years, the public perception has been shifting to mature Beaujolais as their quality continues to increase. And number three, what makes Beaujolais such a great value wine? Well, despite increasing quality and correspondingly increasing prices, Beaujolais still represents a good value compared to bordering regions. It still battles that cheap and cheerful image, and thus its prices remain low compared to its quality. In a sense, this reminds me of German Riesling and Austrian Gruner Veltliner. In the show notes, you'll find the full transcript of my conversation with Natasha links to her website and books, the video versions of these conversations on Facebook and YouTube Live, and where you can order my book online now, no matter where you live. You'll also find a link to take a free online food and wine pairing class with me called The Five Wine and Food Pairing Mistakes That Can Ruin Your Dinner and How to Fix Them Forever at nataliemclean.com forward slash class. That's all in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 279. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, or have read my book or are in the process of reading it at natalie at nataliemclean.com. Email me if you have a sip, tip, question, would like to win a copy of the book on Burgundy, or if you've read my book or are in the process of reading it at natalie at nataliemclean.com. If you missed episode 155, go back and take a listen. I chat about the origins of Beaujolais Nouveau and why it became such a worldwide marketing sensation. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. A madness starts at one minute past midnight on the third Thursday of November when Beaujolais Nouveau is officially released. More than half of the 60 million bottles of this French red wine leave their native villages in southern Burgundy to begin the journey by plane, ship, train, truck, motorcycle, elephant, rickshaw, and on foot to wine lovers around the world. Only weeks before this hot-off-the-press wine was still Gamay Grapes clustered on local vines. 
But the Beaujolais vintners work feverishly fast to harvest, ferment, and bottle the juice so it's ready for the midnight hour. The worldwide release of Beaujolais Nouveau is an extraordinary feat of coordination and marketing. Because of different time zones, the Nouveau is jetted to each country just a few days before its official release at local time. Most of us have to wait at least until the next morning to sample the new harvest. You won't want to miss next week when we continue our chat with Natasha. If you like this episode or learned even just one thing from it, please email or tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in learning more about the wines of Beaujolais Beyond Nouveau. It's easy to find my podcast. Just tell them to search for Natalie McLean Wine on their favorite podcast app, or they can listen to the show on my website. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a mature, elegant Beaujolais. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers.